My name is Eric von Deniken. I am the author of Chariots of the Gods and of many other titles. And of course, every time when I have a public speech, they ask me, Mr. von Deniken, how did it all start? In the meantime, I'm an 85-year-old man. But Chariots of the Gods, I made 53 years ago. So how did it all start? I was educated as a strict Catholic. And I was for six years in a Catholic boarding school in Switzerland, led by Jesuits, the wonderful priests. Of course, I was a deep believer in God. I still am a deep believer in God. But as a young man, my God had to be all over, omnipotent. My God, in my imagination as a young man, would not need a vehicle in which to move around from point A to point B. God is all over. Now in this high school, we had to translate parts of the Bible from Latin to Greek, from Greek to German. And I realized that in the Bible, they describe a God which used a vehicle. Moses, for example, describes how the Lord descends on the holy mountain with smoke, fire, trembling, loud noise, and so on. So I had my doubts in my own Catholic education. And I asked my professors, what's this all about? And they said, well, the prophet had a vision. They saw God sitting in a fiery chariot. But I said, come on, my God does not need a fiery chariot in which to move around. God is all over. So simply, because of my doubts as a young man, I wanted to find out what do other communities in antiquity speak about their gods. So I start to read Sumerian mythologies, Sumerian Babylonian mythologies, legends, stories of the old Egypt, and that was the beginning of Chariots of the Gods. Now once you have an idea, an idea is just a speculation. An idea is not even a hypothesis. So how do you form this speculation into a hypothesis? I give you an example of our days. Most of us are educated in Christianity. So we know worldwide we have hundreds and thousands of fantastic, wonderful churches and cathedrals in all the countries in the world. But none of the architects, none of the painters were eyewitness at the time of Jesus. The Jesus story is 2,000 years in the past and the cathedrals and churches were constructed later. The artists made their wonderful designs later. But none of them was an eyewitness at Jesus' time. Now just transfer this thought into the extraterrestrials. Some extraterrestrials were there. Our ancestors were Stone Age people. They could not understand what was going on. They believed that these extraterrestrials must be some gods. There are no gods. We all know it, but they, in the past, they didn't know it. That's why the so-called called gods entered into mythology, into the religions. But how can we prove this? In antiquity, they chiseled the gods. They made temples in honor of the gods, as we do. We paint the life of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, the Holy Virgin Mary. We make fantastic cathedrals. So I said to myself, if this story in antiquity is correct, if we really were visited by beings from outer space, then we must find some representations of them, some temples, some inscriptions, some writings, some pictures, some chiselings in which we see the God descending. So slowly, from a speculation, the idea grow and grow to a theory and to a hypothesis. I will show you now some of the best, I would say, indications which support this whole idea. As I said, thousands of years ago, extraterrestrials were here. But how do we know this? We know it from the old holy writings in our Christian and Jewish society from the Bible or in the Hindu society from the old holy texts in Hinduism, the Mahabharata, 
for example, the fifth book of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is a volume, has more than 36 big books. One of them is the fifth book, called the Mausala Purva. And there we learn that sometimes three gigantic cities surrounded around our planet. They did not use the word spaceships because at their time they had no word for spaceships. They call it cities. They describe the cities. And of a sudden, out of these cities, smaller vehicles flew down. And out of these smaller vehicles, some so-called gods came out. They looked around. They looked for a few intelligent young men. They teach them. Some of these young men were taken up into the mother spaceship. One of them, his name was Arjuna, he later became a king. He was up there for many years. He learned the language of the extraterrestrial. They teached him in several belongings. And when he was back on Earth, of course, his fellow Earthlings asked him what happened. And he told the story and it was handed down in written form. That's how the fifth book of this Mahabharata appeared. And there Arjuna, the eyewitness up there, said when he came up there, he saw cities, cities in the sky. They looked like gigantic bulls. One bull was connected to the other bull and they surrounded around the earth. Arjuna now even describes he was taken up up there with a small vehicle. He calls this small, small vehicle a Vimana. Now the word Vimana in ancient Hindu definitely means flying objects. And there are different descriptions of these Vimanas. Some of them with wheels or without wheels and so on. So he was brought up with a Vimana to a mother spaceship, to one of these cities in the sky. Arjuna even gives the name of his pilot. The name of his pilot was Matali. Once up there, the strangers teach him their language. They teach him in astronomy, in different sciences, also in engineering, etc. And Arjuna learned that these so-called gods, the extraterrestrials, they had difficulties among themselves. They had fights among themselves. They were not all of the same time. Some of these extraterrestrials wanted to destroy the earth. They wanted to steal our raw material. So a war in heaven took place. And Arjuna was an eyewitness. He described that glittering rays came up of one of the city and destroyed two other cities in the sky. And for the earthlings, it looked if thousands and thousands of small pieces falling stars fell down to the earth. Now when we hear this in an old text, roughly 6,000 years old, we have our doubts. We say, come on, this is all imagination. This is fantasy. They maybe saw the lightning coming down. They heard the thundering or an earthquake or a volcano eruption. And then they believe this is a war in heaven. This explanation is not enough because Arjuna like others, by the way, clearly describe some of the teachings they gave him, some engineering or some astronomical teaching. So it's not just explainable with miracles in the natural. And Arjuna is down here and we have to ask, a war in heaven? So what is heaven? When I grew up as a Catholic, they told me heaven is the place of absolute happiness. Heaven is the place where after death we are united, the good ones are united with the almighty God. It's a peaceful place somewhere in the universe. But now a war in heaven? Then it could not be heaven. But don't we have a similar story in our old, own religious traditions? Just remember in the Bible there was an archangel with the name of Lucifer. And Lucifer went with his disciples to the throne of the Almighty God and said, we don't serve you anymore. And the war in heaven took place. The archangel Michael was fighting against the archangel of Lucifer. So in that case, heaven was not a place of peace, of happiness. There was a war in heaven, even in our own religion. So in different other old traditions, we learn 
that there was a war in, a war in heaven. So we have to translate the word heaven into space. Or we read in the old holy books that there were angels. When I was a boy, I believed angels, these are the ones with the wings, with halos around their heads. They are the peaceful helpers. But angels were also fighters, fighters. They fight it against humans. Just read, for example, here, the second book of the Kings, chapter 19, verse 35. And the angel came down from heaven and killed 185,000 Assyrians. On the next morning, there were only dead bodies in the ground. And this in the Bible, there was no fight, man against man. You know, with spears or arrows, simply an angel from heaven killed 185,000 Assyrians. Now in Egypt, there is a place called Edfu, and there is a temple wall. On this temple wall, we read the same story, but in Egyptian hieroglyphs. There it says, on his winged bark, Horhut, Horhut is the name of the god, flew to the sky and killed all the pharaoh's enemies. He was so fast that they could not even hear or see him. There was no battle. All the enemies were dead. Or in the Asian culture, we have pictures of the god Azura Masta, where he descends and destroys people. So heaven was not the place of happiness. Heaven was space and the angels were not the good ones who win, the peaceful. The angels were some sort of soldiers. And the archangels were the leaders of a group of soldiers. We have to change our translation. If we change only 10 keywords, we change the whole meaning in the old traditions. And that's exactly what I learned. This has, to be, has become one of my specialities. Now, when you hear me like this, please do not forget my mother language is German. My second language is French. English is my third language. So sometimes I have problems to express myself and I kindly ask you for your understanding. When I was a boy in my Catholic boarding school, we also translated parts of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel you find in the Bible. And first, before I explain you Ezekiel, I show you five pictures out of old Bibles, which may explain to you what our forefathers 150, 200 years ago had in mind when they read the text of the prophet Ezekiel in the Bible. Then I explain you what have we made out of Ezekiel, who has helped us, and what is the modern today's knowledge about Ezekiel. First of all, you should know who was Ezekiel. He was professionally a high priest at the Temple of Jerusalem. And at his time, Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians. All the, from the high society, and Ezekiel as a high priest belonged to the high society, they all were captured by the Babylonians. Ezekiel also. He was there with hundreds, maybe thousands of others, and they have to work like slaves, slaves for the Babylonians. And simply, when he, do, he does this, something strange happens. All the workers, they hear a noise in the sky. They look up there, and then they see a vehicle coming down from the sky, and the vehicle makes loud noise. Ezekiel describes the noise. He compares the noise with the thundering of a waterfall. It must have been very, very noisy. So he does not only see something like in a vision, he hears something. And then the noise stops and Ezekiel and all his fellow workers are on the ground. They are afraid. They think God has just landed. Now Ezekiel is high priest by himself. So he thinks it's my duty to stand up and to give honor to the almighty God. So Ezekiel as the first one stands up. And then he realizes this is not God. Just in front of him is a gigantic thing. Ezekiel calls it the splendorness of the highest. 
And here be careful when you read the Bible. In the English Bible, even in the German Bible, you read the splendorness of God. But in the original Ezekiel, the, God, the word God never appears. He calls it the highest, the one up there. So Ezekiel sees something which he cannot explain. He calls it the splendorness of the highest. On top, he sees something like a glittering thing which he cannot explain either. And inside this glittering thing, something like a throne. A throne is a place where somebody sits. And on this throne is the highest sitting in glittering clothes. He has something around his head which Ezekiel cannot understand. And just below of this splendorness of God, he sees four living creatures. And the four living creatures had wings. And when the wings moved, he hears this extremely noise which he compares with the thundering of a waterfall. Under these wings, he sees some wheels. He sees the legs. He definitely describes the legs. He said, they look sparkling like metal. And then he sees the, the, the wheels. He describes four wheels. And here it becomes complicated. At Ezekiel time, wheels do exist. Ezekiel knows wheels which go forward and backward. But the wheels he sees here, on the splendor of the highest, they can not only go forward and backward, they can go on the right and left position. So in all four directions, without making a steering movement. The wings never move. Just imagine you are sitting in the car. You are sitting before your uh, driver's wheel. You turn your driver's wheel and the wheels in front make a turning so that you can come into the curve. Ezekiel sees a wheel which go forward, backward, right and left, but it makes never a turn. The wheels never turn. That's what confuses him completely. He writes four times about the wheel. Etc. Etc. Just read Ezekiel when you have time. You will realize it's a fantastic story. And very important, Ezekiel is an eyewitness. He speaks in the first person. I did. I saw. I hear. Not in the third person. As somebody have told me this. Now it's in the first person. It's roughly 30 years ago, I had a speech at NASA, American Space Administration in Huntsville. And during my speech, about five minutes, minute, minutes, I explained the case of the prophet of Ezekiel. After my speech, we had a wonderful dinner with all these rocket men, these professors and doctors, and the lead the leading man of the engineers, Mr. Joseph Blumrich. He was a former Austrian, came to me, very friendly. And he said, yes, Mr. Van Dernin, that was quite interesting, but in the Bible, you will never find technology. The Bible, these are visions, these are dreams, these are ideas. Maybe Ezekiel was an epileptic, but no reality. There is no technology in the Bible. So you will definitely lose the case. And then he friendly said, I must admit, I never read the Bible. I never read Ezekiel. That's what I'm going to do now. And Joe Blumrich, at that time, the chief of the department of this, this uh, construction, that was before the moon landing, he started to read Ezekiel. And step by step, he becomes curious. Ezekiel made clear descriptions of what he described, the splendorness of the highest. So this NASA chief started to recalculate, to make designs. Then two other NASA high engineers came to his office and said, Joe, what are you doing with the Bible on your desk? And Mr. Blumrich said, hey, this man Ezekiel, he clearly gives description which are usable to us we can recalculate and redesign Ezekiel. And that's what they did. So they turned absolutely their meaning. And here you see the result of what NASA did. That was what Ezekiel described as the splendorness of the highest. 
On top, you see something which was glittering. It was a commanding space with the view all around. Inside, a GK is something like a throne, a chair, the place where the commander was sitting, in glittering suits, which Ezekiel could not explain. And then Ezekiel speaks about the four living creatures. Well, I'm sorry, where do you are? Where are the four living creatures? Don't forget one thing. At Ezekiel's time, there was no motors, something which moved by themselves. In their eyes, must have been living. Now, these wings moved by themselves, so in their eyes, it was living creatures. It is definitely clear that Ezekiel means the helicopters because he say when they stood still, the wings were looking downwards. When the noise started again, the wings went up. He even described when the wings lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up too. Of course, when a helicopter's wings take up, the wheels take up too. And then the legs and all the detail. And the wheels. The wheel is one of the very, very important indication in the case of Ezekiel. You remember, Ezekiel wrote that the wheels could go forward, backward, left and right without making a steering movement. This was confusing for the NASA engineers. And finally, they reconstructed the new wheel. And there it is. This wheel is separated from the wheel's axis into different little segments. Each segment ends in its own little axle. And it's clear, with this wheel, you can go forward, backward, right and left without making a steering movement. You can move in any desired direction. By the way, NASA got a patent on this wheel. So we have an international patent for a wheel and in reality, the whole idea came out of the Bible. I think this is not bad. Now, when you read Ezekiel, you realize of a sudden he says, the splendorness of the highest returned. That means this vehicle was coming a second time. And this time he says, the hands of the highest took me up onto the chair. In my point, in my view, he was simply sitting on the chair of the co-pilot. Then they fly away. Ezekiel's spear, uh, Ezekiel feels the start. He says, and they pressed me into my chair. But he doesn't know where they fly. He writes, they brought me to a very, very high mountain. No idea where he was. Then he sees under him something like a big village or a small city. And the man next to him, the pilot, explained to Ezekiel, look at all this, look down there and keep it in your mind because you write, you have to write about all this. And Ezekiel realized they fly over this big village or small city and in the center of it was something like a temple. And there you have to be careful. Ezekiel always uses the word, it looks like. It looks like a human. It looks like a temple. It looks like a building. Why is it? It looks like. Why does it say it is? Because he doesn't know himself what it is. He has to use the comparisons. He says it looks like a temple. Now we have to ask ourselves what was a temple some thousands of years ago? For the people at that time, a temple was a building for the gods. That's why they were living. Only later, a temple has to be, become a holy place in the sense of spiritualism, in the sense of religion. So Ezekiel sees in this big village something like a temple. He himself is sitting in the chair of the co-pilot. They fly over it, over the so-called temple, the splendor of the highest came to a standstill. And slowly, slowly, they descend into the building. And at that moment, Ezekiel realized that the noise of the wings were as double as loud as at the first time. Because now the echo comes down, the echo from the walls. Finally, they came to a standstill. It becomes quiet. The motors are shut down. And Ezekiel 
goes out of the vehicle. And there, another one in glittering clothes came to Ezekiel. And to say hello, he simply was mocking about the humans. He said, oh, come on, humans, you humans, you have eyes to see, but you see nothing. You have ears to hear, but you hear nothing. And then all of a sudden, this stranger in glittering clothes gives to Ezekiel a measuring device. It doesn't matter what kind of device it was. It depends on different Bible, you have different translation, but it was always an object with which you could measure. And the stranger gives order to Ezekiel to measure this whole temple, the whole building. Now Ezekiel, in the meantime, he clearly knows that this is not God. So he has courage. He has the courage to ask back, why? Why should I measure these things? And the stranger says, that's why we brought you here, human. So Ezekiel starts to measure length, bright, high, everything. Just read it in the Bible. There are pages and pages of measurements of the so-called temple. Now in Germany, there was an engineer. His name is Dr. Hans Herbert Bayer. And he read Ezekiel. And he also came to these measurements of the so-called temple. And he asked himself, are these real measurements of a real building or is this just imagination? Is this just vision? The same thing which the NASA people in America did. The German engineer did in Germany. But the NASA group, National Space Administration, they only reconstructed the, 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 uh, the splendor of the highest. Now the Germans only reconstructed the so-called temple. One day, I had a big yellow envelope on my desk and after opening it, I had different designs and different calculations and the letter of an unknown, at that time, unknown man to me, Dr. Hans Herbert Bayer, and he explained, dear Mr. von Däniken, I reconstructed exactly according to the measurements of Ezekiel in the Bible, I reconstructed this building and here is the result. I was absolutely baffled. It was astonishing. I, of course, immediately contacted this German engineer, Hans Herbert Bayer, and I asked him, do you know what the Americans at NASA did with Ezekiel? The Germans had no idea of what the Americans did. So I brought the two groups together and it all fits perfectly. The so-called temple was nothing else but this, the air base, the reconstruction, the repair base for the extraterrestrial space shuttle. It all fits perfectly. NASA reconstru reconstructed the splendorness of the highest. The German engineer reconstructed only the building. And both fit together. This is what we call a proof by indication. So finally, what happens all there? We made a computer animation. Here you have it. Ezekiel is captured with others on the river with the name of Cheba. They hear a noise somewhere in the, in the firmament. They look up there and then they see an object coming down. The noise becomes louder and louder. And the people, the workers on the earth are afraid. They run away. Finally, they all fell into, into the ground. But Ezekiel, the profession, is high priest. He believes that the almighty God has arrived, that it is his duty to give honor to the almighty God. So Ezekiel as the first stands up and then he realizes this is not God. He realizes this is something which is technical, but I cannot understand. So he calls the whole thing the splendorness of the highest. He describes the wheels. He describes the wings. He describes that bit, bit, between the wings there was something glittering. It was the cooler for the atomic reactor. He sees the, 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 the feet which, which were sparkling like metal. He realized the different four we, uh, wheels which could go into every direction, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, 
without making a steering movement, which astonished him completely. Finally, he was taken up. He was putting into the chair of the co-pilot. They start. A GPL even feels the pressure on his body when they start. But he has no idea where they go. That's why he writes, they brought me on a very, very high mountain. When you read Ezekiel, that's important. It does not say, they brought me on a mountain. It does not say, they brought me on a high mountain. They say, they brought me on a very, very high mountain. And beneath of him, of a sudden, he sees something like a big village or a small city with different buildings. And in them, one big building, which he says, it looked like a temple. He himself is sitting in the splendorness of the highest. And he realized that the splendorness of the highest makes a standstill over the so-called temple. Then slowly, slowly, the vehicle descends, moves into the building, which means the building had no roof. And at that moment, Ezekiel realized that the noise of the wheels of the living creature was as double as high as before, because now he hears the echo which comes back from the wall of the wings. The vehicle comes to a standstill, the motors are shut down, and all of a sudden, this strange man in glittering suits come to Ezekiel and says, oh, human, you humans have no eyes. You have eyes to see, but you see nothing. You have ears to hear, but you hear nothing. And then he has a measuring device in his hands and he gives order to Ezekiel to measure the whole temple. And Ezekiel has the courage to ask back, why should I measure the temple? And the strangers simply say, that's why we brought you here, because you have to measure this temple. Now here is the moment to make a short stop to ask us about the religious explanation. I have studied Ezekiel in my school. We have translated Ezekiel from one language to the other, and I know very well what I am talking about. In the religions, believe, they, they say Ezekiel had a vision. He saw the almighty God on his wonderful throne sitting. But as I said before, I'm a deep believer in God. I am one of these humans who still pray every day. But my God does not need a vehicle which moves from one point to the other. My God is all over. Then Ezekiel is brought down and he gives every detail as we just have seen before of this splendorness of the highest of the of the the building etc etc the religious interpretation is simply wrong in religion they believe that Ezekiel has a vision of a future temple in the future Jerusalem now you have to ask yourself Ezekiel writes as an eyewitness he says I saw I was there I hear but when you read Ezekiel about this temple you will read and the temple we be will be such and such large so and so long so and so high will be means future and not present but Ezekiel was talking in the present why is the Bible translated into the future the temple will be because the theologians believe that Ezekiel has a vision of a future temple in a future Jerusalem. But this is wrong again. Ezekiel describes they brought me on a very, very high mountain. In Jerusalem, there is no mountain, no very, very high mountain. He's not talking about the future. He's talking about the building which exists right now. And why? Why did he have to make these measurements? The stranger told it to him. That's the reason why we brought you here. Why? For what purpose should Ezekiel, a human, some two and a half thousand years in the past, measured a building of the extraterrestrials on a high mountain? What for? I simply have an idea. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine the situation. Ezekiel is high priest. He is captured with many, many others. They have to work like slaves on a river called 
the river of Cheba. They are there. Now of a sudden, the whole working group hears a noise. Then they see a vehicle coming down. And the vehicle, some of the vehicle's arms come out and took Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the leader of the group. He's high priest by profession. They took him away. Now all his colleagues ask themselves, what happened here? This was God. God took Ezekiel away. Now a few hours passed, maybe a few days, we don't know. And then they bring back Ezekiel. Now they are all happy. They stand around him. They're asking, hey, Ezekiel, what happened to you? Where have you been? And Ezekiel is very proud. And he explains to them, I was there. They brought me on a very, very high mountain. I had to measure a building. Here are the measuring dates. Now his society, and even himself, at least in the beginning, they believe that it all has to do with God, with the Almighty God. So this situation enters into the holy books of humanity. You know, the extraterrestrials knew exactly these mankind, these humans, they will have wars in the next coming thousand years. They will fight against each other, but their holy texts will never be destroyed. The holy texts are translated into different languages over all fronts. That's what the extraterrestrials knew. They knew that what Ezekiel saw would enter into the holy literature because they all believe it has to do with God. And that's exactly what happened. Ezekiel was translated. And today we have Ezekiel's writing. Not only him, we have different others. As I mentioned at the beginning, from the Indian mythology, from the Hindu mythology, or from the book of Enoch, etc. We have these old texts today because they were handed down. And they were only handed down because the people at that time believed it has to do with God. And today, we are in a situation where we have flying machines. We are able to fly over the planet. We realize that this text of Ezekiel and others have nothing to do with God, but with technology. And because of these texts, we have to come up with the question, what happened? Were they visited by beings from outer space? If yes, what did these extraterrestrials want to? Why were they here? With what technology? What speed? What is their home base, their home planets? Will they return? Will they destroy us? Will they be friendly? All these questions we ask because of the old texts. Now Ezekiel, some thousands of years ago, asked the man in glittering clothes, the extraterrestrials, why should I measure this temple? And the answer said was, that's why we brought you up to do this. They knew exactly thousands and thousands of years in the future these texts would still exist and the humans in the future would start to ask them what was wrong, what happened at that time. That was the reason for all. And it perfectly worked. There is one thing in the discussion about extraterrestrials on our planet which nerves me every day. I get furious. What's about? I'm talking about Nazca. What is Nazca? Nazca is a desert in Peru, roughly 500 kilometers south of Lima. When you are a pedestrian on Nazca, you are on the desert, all that you see is little brown stones and of course brown sand. Soon as you fly over the same desert, you start to see big figures. Figures which are scratched in the ground. Figures of fishes, monkeys, spiders, humans, flowers, and all kinds of things. You fly higher again, then you see big lines, gigantic lines, starting abruptly, ending abruptly. The longest of it is 3.8 kilometers long. The natives who live here, they separate three different things. They see the figures, they call the figures las figuras. Then they see small lines. You see some of these small lines? The longest of it is roughly 23 kilometers long. 
They call it Las Líneas. And then you see the large lines. The large lines look like airstrips. I never said it is an airstrip, but it looks like airstrip. So the natives call it Las Pistas. So you have three things in the plane of Nazca. Las figuras, Las Líneas, Las Pistas. And what unnerves me is always in TV documentaries, even in scientific books, they explain you how easy it is to make these figures. You simply have to crash away some of the brown stones of the surface and automatically a higher blending, a higher color appears because the sun was shining thousands and thousands of years over the desert. And soon you crash away the surface, you see a, a, a higher surface coming up. So you can scratch away the brown stones and you can create these figures. Fishes, monkeys, spiders and so on. It's in fact very, very easy to make these figures. The figures were never a mystery. Never something which has to do with extraterrestrials. But what, what unnerves me, they don't show you these gigantic lines. And they really look like airstrips. As I said, they start abruptly, they end abruptly. In a scientific literature, at least 20 different explanations have, have become brought up to the surface until today. I read, this whole plain of Natska is a cult for the water gods. No, it's a cult for the mountain gods. Another said, it's a cult for agriculture. It's really ridiculous. There was never agriculture on this desert. Or I say, it was a pre-Inca sport place, something like a pre-Inca Olympia. Or I say, it's just a Fata Morgana. Then, a start place for hot air balloons. I read in a scientific book, these lines were acre plots, boundary makers, procession streets, maps, a cultural atlas. All kind of nonsense has been suggested by the community, but all of them never came to the truth. You see some of these lines? This picture, which you just see now, scrub it into your brain. You will never see it on a TV documentary or never in scientific books. And this is original Natska. It even becomes worse. Here we have a line, and you see this line? Under the line is a zigzag line. And it's something it looks like an airstrip. It was it is never shown on documentaries. And what is most important, this line is made on a cut-off mountain. The mountain top is cut off. The mountain was made flat artificially in Stone Age time with chicken bones or what. And you never see these kind of pictures in TV documentaries. You never read about them. They always present the people, the figures, the fishes, the monkeys, the spiders. There is no mystery with the figures. The mystery are these gigantic lines. The mystery are these cut off mountains. And that's what's important. And not the rest of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely sure, roughly 6,000 years ago, some extraterrestrials were here. I know it because they teach some of our humans. They took them into their spaceship. They teach them in astronomy, in their own language, in engineering and so on. They teach our forefathers also in engineering. One of them who was teach engineering has the name of Enoch. He clearly, in his own book, written in the first person, the book of Enoch, he says that they teach him in engineering, in astronomy, astronomy and etc. And the same Enoch was the one who gave order to construct the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Oh sorry, didn't we know that the Great Pyramid in Egypt was made by a man with the name of Cheops? I come back to that. We still until today have no real idea how the pyramid was constructed. The most known answer or suggestion is 
They made a gigantic ramp, but the pyramid is roughly four kilometers away from the Nile, where the stones were transported. So the ramp must have been four kilometers high, higher and bigger in volume than the pyramid itself. Even if you construct the ramp around the pyramid, it doesn't matter. The stone which you use for the ramp have more volume than the stones of the pyramid itself. So we have no idea how it was made. Different suggestions were made. Most of these suggestions come from engineers, intelligent people and in intelligent suggestions. But the problem is they had to have the knowledge. Even according to Egyptology, the Great Pyramid was made 2,500 BC, roughly 4,500 from today. But that was Stone Age. The father of Cheops, his name was Snorfu, was a Stone Age people, especially his grandfather. They did not have the technical knowledge of ropes and all these things which you see here. What I present here is technology, but you have to, to have the knowledge of the, the technology. And at Cheops' time, they did not have this knowledge. So we really have 25 theories how the Great Pyramid was constructed, but we have no conclusive answer. Of course, I am not of the opinion that extraterrestrials made the pyramid. It was us, it was the humans, but they did it for the extraterrestrials. Inside the pyramid are different shafts, and one of these shafts points exactly to the star constellation of Sirius, Sirius was Isis, and the other one to the star constellation of Orion. My friend, Mr. Boval, has suggested that the three pyramids represents the three stars of the Orion belt. And I think this is a reasonable suggestion, because the oldest god of Egypt was Osiris, and Osiris is the same as Orion. Inside the pyramid we have three chambers, and in our solar system we have three planets which we call the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Now the three chambers inside the Great Pyramid has the same equivalent distance to our three inner planets, Mercury, Venus and uh, Mars. And the distance from the North Pole to the center of the Great Pyramid is equal, it's the same distance. So all these could be coincidences, but there are much more of these coincidences and we really don't know where the knowledge comes from. The three pyramids are very gigantic buildings and inside these buildings are different shafts. You see about roughly 823 after Christ, the pyramid was opened the first time and the man who opened it did not found the main entrance. He simply chiseled the hole through the stones. In the meantime, we know the main entrance. Now inside the pyramid, there is first a gallery which is called the upgoing gallery. Now you have to imagine, this is roughly one meter high. So you have to go down on your shoulders, on your knees, and you transpire ter terribly. It's an incredible heat inside. You climb up here 23 meters. This passageway is so small, they could not even transport a sarcophagus in there. After these 23 me two meters, you come to what they call the Grand Gallery. Now this is really grand, because it's about eight and a half meter high and roughly 47 meters long. Now the first question is up here. Why did the constructors of the Great Pyramid first make this small, narrow shaft which you could not stand upwards, you have to climb inside and then this gigantic great gallery. We have absolutely no idea. At the end of the great gallery there are two rooms. One room is called the King's Chamber and the other room is called the Queen's Chamber. We go now to the lower room, the so-called Queen's Chamber. By the way, all these words, King's Chamber, Queen's Chamber, 
great galleries are words of our time. We don't know how the ancestors called them. I am here now in the Queen's Chamber and you see a hole in the wall. Now you clearly have to know that exactly the same hole exists <coughs> on the other side. There's so, a cross of it. And you see my, my fingers. I want to point that the hole is very narrow. It's about 14 centimeters on one side. That means you cannot climb in. In archaeology, this hole is known only roughly since 160 years in the past, before the walls were closed. And then a British man came to the pyramid, and of course he was looking for treasures, and he was knocking on the wall, and he saw, it sounded like hollow, so he took a hammer and a chisel, and he opened this little shaft. And on the other side of the wall, the same shaft. In archaeology, they believe that these are ventilation shafts. This is ridiculous. I just told you the shafts were closed. So there was no air coming in. And in archaeology, they all, always suggest that the shafts, both shafts, the one on the north and on the south side, are more or less eight meters long. And then they have a blind end. And then, some 25 years ago, one of my friends came to Egypt and he constructed a small robot. And he went to the bosses of the uh, Bureau of Antiquity and he asked them for permission to go with his robots inside these shafts. Finally, he received the permission because in archaeologists they believe, come on, what's, what's all this? The shaft is anyhow just eight meters uh, uh, long and then it has a dead end. So the robot entered into this shaft and then the new mystery appeared. First you see the robot was constructed, it was a steel, a little steel monster. It had uh, three cameras, you could move upside downwards in every direction. He had uh, seven motors and it was a steel construction, it had four wheels. And slowly this robot entered into the shaft. Now in the beginning, the robot was moving just two meters uh, horizontally. After two meters, it starts to climb up inside the pyramid. In archaeology, they believe that the shaft must end after eight meters. But the robot continued. Ten meters, twelve meters, fourteen meters. It had no end. The walls always changed. The different stones changed on the walls. Sometimes it was granite, then it was andesite, then it was diorite, all kinds of like marmor looking. Then some, uh, some passages which look like doors. Now when you see these pictures, you might believe that this is a big shaft where humans can climb in. No, do not forget one side length is roughly 14 or 15 centimeters, so nobody can climb in there. So the robot went there, slowly, slowly climbing up inside the shaft. And then we saw some scratchings on the wall. And the wall in this position is completely flat. The 8 meter passage was gone a long time ago, the robot continued, 20 meter, 25 meter, 30 meter, after 32 meter he came to a standstill because a stone blocked the way further up. Now the robot moved forward and backward and finally managed to pass this block and he continued his voyage inside the Great Pyramid. This was the position of meter 32. After that passage, the robot climbed up and up 40 meter, 45 meter, 50 meter, 60 meter, and only at 62 meter the robot came to a standstill. There was something like a door which had two uh, bracelets. One of them was broken up. 
you see the broken tile here uh, here on the the right side which is curious because the broken piece comes from the left side and the walls are polished here now if you look at the lower end of the picture you will see a light a small light just it, it's a light of the laser of the robot and this laser light will pass under the doorway which means there must be something behind the doorway so this could not be the end of it now at that time Rudolf Gantenbrink the man who constructed this robot and who made these pictures he could not continue his drops his strips about uh, four years later from the American side the National Geographic Society came with another robot and these American people they made a hole through this small door and with their robot they put a camera into the small hole into the door and what they could see was simply 23 meter behind this door there was another door a room first and another door again years and years passed and then a rich man came a rich man from Singapore and he had the money for another robot he again went to the Department of Antiquity and asked for permission to go in there they called this robot Jedi Jedi now they needed a, a long drill otherwise they could not go into the small hole which was made by the robot before from National Geographic so slowly this robot went in there they put a camera not bigger than an endoscope into the hole and what did they show the next room and in this next room was something like writings it does not look exactly like writing but at least we have something which is on the wall in, in, a, in a rusty color we have no idea what it is so the mystery continues this is the present knowledge which we had to have from the inside the great pyramid but practically every year scientists discover new shafts and rooms inside the pyramid with modern equipment but we never hear in public what's going in there because all these shafts are so small that you cannot just jump in there or work in there or climb in there you need high technology to go in there and I guess the builders of the pyramid know exactly what they did according to our knowledge the great pyramid was constructed by Cheops Cheops was a pharaoh roughly two and a half thousand BC I said before Cheops father Snorfu he came from Stone Age now Cheops of course at his time they would be able to make a construction like the pyramid I mean with stones and so but what they would not be able is the planning inside the pyramid we have different shafts we have different rooms and all this has to be planned designed before you start construction because you cannot finish a pyramid and now a priest arrives and say hey I need a room and the shaft but with 14 centimeters on one side you cannot even climb with the Lilliput man in there so you have to plan all this before the building and this planning does not fit into Cheops times they were Stone Age people they did not have the engineering and the calculating and the planning now everyone believes that Cheops was the construction but the old Arabian writers they say no it was not Cheops the Great Pyramid was made before the Great Flood by a pharaoh with the name of Saurit and they precisely say Saurit is the same figure which the Hebrew society calls Enoch and the Greek society calls Hermes now Enoch he's brilliant I know the story of Enoch Enoch was one of the human and there is a book of Enoch which he himself wrote in the first person this book of Enoch was found more than 200 years in an old uh, Ethiopian library in the book of Enoch he describes in the first person what happened to him he says that the guardians of the skies surrounded the planet earth similar as what Ezekiel says 
He says two guardians of the sky descended. They took him up into the heaven, into the mother spaceship. They teach him their language. One of them, <coughs> the astronomer, says to young Enoch, humans, look out there. Do you see this little light? You humans call it moon, but the moon has no light by itself. The moon receives his light from the sun. And then he exclaims, explains why the moon sometimes is high, full, empty, half, etc. The stranger explains to Hinoch the solar system. He says to the young man, you see this bright shining light out there? You humans, you call it the sun. But this sun is just a sun like all the other suns. You see this little light shining there in the universe? All these lights are suns like your sun. And he explains to Enoch that around the sun planets are moving. <coughs> he explains that our planet, the Earth, is surrounding our sun in 365 days plus uh, weekly uh, hours. All this is astronomy. All this is scientific knowledge. Some of my uh, critics always say, come on, the, our answers, they simply describe the moon and the stars and the lightning and the earthquake and the sun, they were afraid of it. And so they created natural religions, which is true in the beginning, our ancestors had natural religions. But the explanation of natural religions is not enough because natural, the sun, the earth, the earthquake, does not give scientific information. Nature does not say to a human, hey, human, look out there. You see this little light? You humans call it moon. The moon has no light by itself. The moon receives its light from the sun, etc., etc. This is scientific information. So the natural explanation does not help. We have to look for other explanations. Now, uh, roughly two and a half thousand years from now on, the Greek historian Herodotus was in Egypt too. Herodotus wrote two books about Egypt and he made clear differences between what he sees with his own eyes and what he works with his feet and what they tell him. And Enoch says, uh, uh, Herodotus says that he heard the story that the Great Pyramid was made by Cheops, but he only said, I heard it. And then clearly all the historians which after Herodotus, for example, Theodore of Sicily, Strabon, Plutarch, they all were in Egypt after Herodotus. They correct Herodotus. They say, come on, he's wrong. We ask the local priest, who is the constructor of this pyramid? And the locals did not know it. They say, we don't know because he was four before the great flood. And Enoch was living before the great flood. Enoch in the Old Testament is mentioned as the first human who disappears from our, our planet before the great flood, long before the later prophet Elijah. Now Enoch, in the book of Enoch, he describes his teachers. They taught him also in engineering. And Enoch gives the order to construct the great pyramid. That's what the Arabian historians say. And why? Why should he give order to construct the pyramid? Because inside the pyramid, they should deposit all his writings, all his books, because a great flood would come and destroy the planet Earth. And after the flood, the humans should find a pyramid not destroyed. And inside the pyramid, the writings for the future of this generation. But these writings were handed down in the deep past. So I'm absolutely sure inside the Great Pyramid, in some of these rooms, they will find in the next years, we will find a gigantic library with the books of Enoch. Now this Herodotus, he was also up on the Nile in the city of Thebes. Thebes is what they call today Luxor. And then he, he writes in the second book of history that the priest showed him on a straight 241 statues, one statue next to the other. And the high priest gave an explanation to every of these statues. And after the end on the road, the high priest said that these 241 statues represent 11,000 
340 years. And at that time, the gods from the firmament <coughs> was among the humans. Since that time, the gods have never returned. That's what Herodot heard from the priest. The same Herodot also writes that under the Great Pyramid there is a lake with clear water and in the lake there is a sarcophagus and in the sarcophagus are remains and gifts of the god Osiris. Osiris is the one which is equivalent to Orion. So all this is written in Herodot's books but our archaeologists never took it for truth. They say, come on, what is he, what is he speaking? 11,340 years in the past? This is nonsense. Now, Herodotus made his statement roughly two and a half thousand years from now on. So we have to add the two and a half thousand years to the 11,340. Roughly you come to 14,000 years when extraterrestrials, the guardians of the sky, were among the humans. Now in archaeology, they never took this figures for real. The official uh, history of Egypt starts roughly 3000 BC, but not 14,000 BC. And also Herodotus said that under the pyramid there is a sea or a lake. This is impossible. We are in the desert. It's all, it's all empty. It's all dry. There is no lake, they said. So they never took Herodotus war for serious. In the meantime, we know there is a lake under the pyramid. Of course, I was there together with Ramon, with my secretary. Now, the entry is left on one side of the Great Pyramid. You came to a, to a room, and this room is chiseled out of the rock. Now you see this uh, staircases here. They, of course, date from our time. This is not from Cheops time. You came to this room, and from this place, you go directly into the rock straight down and even you see the the shaft is so large so wide that two letters have room there's room for two letters inside then you came to a small room and in this small room you see seven niches cut out of the rock but only in two niches are some sarcophaguses one of them is uh, of andesite this is a uh, uh, volcanic rock and we don't understand it because there are no volcanoes, volcanoes near. The other one is granite and they told me there was nothing in these sarcophaguses. If it's true or not, I cannot know for sure. Now you go down there deeper. You have just seen one shaft which was large, large enough for two letters. The continuation is not the same shaft. It's uh, smaller. There is only room for one letter. You go deep directly under the pyramid into the rock. Finally, you come to a, a, a point where you have to go down your knees. And rectangular, you have to climb on your knees before you can stand up again. And then you see something in your flashlights like water. And closer and closer you see water. There is in fact a lake. It's a small lake. And inside the lake, there is a sarcophagus covered by water. You see, the water is so clear, we could not use flashlights. If you would have used flashlights, we simply would have a reflection, like in the mirror. That's why we have to make, we have to make these pictures in a way without flashlight. But you simply can see the, the form, the size of the sarcophagus. Now we measured this sarcophagus, length, wide, high, and it's definitely bigger then the second part of the shaft, which was so small that, only, that there was only room for one letter. So the sarcophagus cannot have been transported down there. There must be other entries. Now you see it's all covered by water. The Egyptologists, they are clever persons and intelligent persons. They of course knew there must be other entries too. So at one day they brought some pumps and they pumped out the water of here. It's groundwater. Now you see the sarcophagus, the same sarcophagus as before, without the water. Absolutely sensational. Also here, they told me that there was nothing in the sarcophagus. I cannot find out if this is true or not.
but simply imagine how and why does somebody make shafts deep on the side of the pyramid in the ground and makes a sarcophagus in the groundwater. I mean, these are technological problems. Was the pyramid itself not big enough? Not strong enough? What was hidden down here? Why have somebody done this gigantic job? We simply have no answer. It's one of the miracles. And the miracles continue. These so-called extraterrestrials, they teach the few humans, and before they left, they said to some of our humans, we will return in a far future. Do not forget this. Hand it down to the next generations. No. And this promise, this promise of return was handed down into every culture of this planet. Maybe you remember when uh, Christoph Columbus for the first time came to Central America, the natives believed he was a god, the long-awaited god. The same thing happens for Hernando Cortes, the Spanish conqueror of Central America. The natives believed he is the long-awaited god. Or Francisco Pizarro, he was the one who came first time to Peru, South America. Again, the natives believed he is the long-awaited god. Or far away in the South Sea, Captain Cook, the British explorer, the, 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 the native from Hawaii believed he is the long-awaited god. So this explanation of somebody will return in the far future is not an invention of Christianity. This was handed down thousands of years ago by the extraterrestrials and it entered into mythology, it entered into the cultures, it entered into our religions. I am educated as a Christian. We Christians believe that one day Jesus will return. But the Muslim society say no, one day the Mahdi will return. And as we know, the great Jewish society, they say no, one day the Messiah will return. Now obviously not every religion can be right. Some of them must be wrong. I suggest they are all wrong. Neither Jesus, nor the Messiah, nor the Mahdi will return. Simply extraterrestrials will return. And we have good reasons to believe that at the moment they are back here again. We are observed. We are under observation. Somebody is watching us at the moment. But this is a theme which I explain in a later speak. Now I don't want to go into the topic of the UFOs. Of course I am criticized since Chariots of the Gods. This is very normal. I love my critics. It doesn't matter how you attack me. You are all intelligent persons. I love to debate with you. And some of the critics always say, even if we accept that extra extraterrestrials do exist, they would never look like us. Evolution on another planet would develop completely different. And even if we accept all this, it is not possible to come together because the distances from star to star are too long, measured in light years, so it is not possible to reach our planet Earth. And all this is wrong. I explain this shortly. The next solar system, Alpha Proxima Centauri, is roughly four light years away from it. How could we reach this distance? Or even further to Sirius, eight light years away. How is it possible? With today's rocket propulsion, liquid propulsion, it is absolutely impossible. But of course, our clever scientists have found solutions how to do it. I explain to you how today, with our today's technology, we could reach these distances. Everyone knows the space shuttle. With every shot you, uh, shot, you transport roughly 30 tons of heavy load into an orbit between the Earth and the Moon. Now you have to use many of these space shuttles, not only two or three. You should start practically every two or three weeks. Every two or three weeks you transport 30 tons of heavy load into an orbit. Between Earth and Moon, you construct of these prefabricated blocks a gigantic ring. It has to be a ring. Soon as the ring is finished, you turn the ring around its own axis. By doing so, 
you reach centrifugal force. When centrifugal force inside the ring, they work like a artificial gravitation. You don't swim uh, weightless around. You always have ground under your feet. Then you have to make some sort of uh, rocket propulsion. Of course, not liquid propulsion. This is too primitive. Some of the future propulsion. And in future, it is definitely possible to reach, to reach a speed, for example, of only 2% of the speed of light. If this vehicle would only reach 2% of the speed of light, it would make the distance of 10 light years within 500 human years. Now the critics say, come on, nobody will survive 500 human years. This is not necessary. Imagine this spaceship is a, is a mother spaceship, is a generation spaceship. Inside the spaceship you make love, you make children, <coughs> new children are born. Maybe the fifth or the tenth generation will reach the distance, but it is possible. You can do it this way. So with 2% of the speed of light, you would reach the distance of 10 light years within 500 years. Now imagine, in this 500 years, the astronomers on board, they of course will to want to find out, is there a planet around the suns? And it has to be a planet similar to our Earth, because they cannot land on a planet like Jupiter or like Mercury. It's too hot. You, you would, you, you, they would be destroyed. So you need an Earth-like planet. According to NASA, only in our Milky Way, not in the whole universe, only in our Milky Way, there is a roughly 50 billions of Earth-like planets. So they will find an Earth-like planet. The generation spaceship would go into an orbit. They would, the generation spaceship would never make a landing. With every landing, the generation spaceship would broke up, broke up. It was composited piece by piece some thousand years ago, 500 years ago, between the Earth and the Moon. So it never makes a landing. It always stays in orbit. But now smaller vehicles, today we call them space shuttle, will reach the surface of the newly developed planet. And now the crew receives order. You have 500 years time to develop an industrial society. Now wait a moment. They were 500 years on flight, 2% the speed of light. Now they receive other 500 years in plus altogether 1000 years to <coughs> construct a society which has <coughs> industries. Is this possible in 500 years? First we have to ask us how old is our industrial society? 180 years? 200 years? And our industrial society is the product of our forefathers and grandfathers and grand grand grandfathers. They had to develop everything, develop to, to test everything. It's a long chain of evolution. The technological evolution took thousands of years until we have our industrial, industrial society. But these workers out there, they don't have to start from the beginning. They have all their data in their computer of the whole development of, of technology, including the construction of a mother spaceship. They have all the knowledge. All what they need is the industries, the raw material. Now you give them 500 years and they have the knowledge that generation spaceship will tell us the crew on the ground, hey, there you find minerals, there you find raw materials of all, all kind, there you find uranium, etc. So after 500 years, they have an industrial society. And this society would be able to reconstruct <coughs> a second generation spaceship. And then it becomes intelligent and interesting. Once there was only one spaceship, 500 years on the way. After another 500 years, there are two the old and the new one, and then there are four, and eight, and sixteen. Now a snowball system comes into work. 
with only 2% of the speed of light, <laughs> you would develop our whole Milky Way with industrial societies within 10 millions of years. And we started with only one spaceship. So of course, it is possible to spread out even without speed of light or over speed of light. What a perspective. I am sure extraterrestrials visited us and I even go further. They created humans according to their own image. We are the offsprings of them. I am always asked how do extraterrestrials look like? On another solar system, another planet, they look completely different than we. This is quite possible. It is possible that extraterrestrials look like, uh, I don't know, octopuses or beings with tentacles or flying elephants or whatever. This is possible. But at the same time, there are some extraterrestrials who are looking like us, who are similar to us. Why? The Swedish Nobel Prize trigger, Nobel Prize winner, Savante Arrhenius, I said he is dead since 80 years, had a brilliant idea, he called it panspermia. He said, imagine somewhere in our universe, it started, the first intelligent life form of life. Now the critics say, come on, you just moved the, the problem into the next solar system. How did it start? We have no idea how did it start. We don't know within religion, neither in science. In religion, they teach us in the beginning there was God. So you have to ask, where did God come from? Who created God? What is God? In science, they would say, no, in the beginning it was the Big Bang. Okay, but what created the Big Bang? Even if you have a so-called original atom, it must come from somewhere. Nothing comes from nothing, not even in, in, in astral sciences. So we have no answer what the beginning was, neither in religion nor in science. So we have simply to say, somehow it started. This is what the British Nobel Prize winner, Savante Arrhenius said, someone it had to start. The first intelligent form of life had the wish to spread out their own form of life. Now they don't take spaceships and move light years away from their own solar systems. They simply infect their Milky Way with millions and millions and billions of their own forms of life, their own cells of life, the information of life. Today we know the information in the cell is the DNS. Now, DNA, the DNA. In Zurich, there is a very brilliant and well-known high school uh, university called the ETH, the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule. They had published a paper some years ago. They said they tested DNA under extreme heat, under extreme cold, in the vacuum, vacuum, etc. It does not change. Soon as DNA is in normal temperature, it functions normally again. So you infect a sector of your Milky Way with billions of billions of DNA. And you know exactly the biggest part of it will fall into the gravity of a sun or the gravity of a planet where they cannot survive. For example, a, a Jupiter a gravity would kill it or, or a, a Mercury is too hot, too close to the sun, etc. But a small part of it will come into the gravity of a planet which is similar to the one which started the game, like Earth. And now evolution starts. The information comes from outside. This is what is called panspermia. It's directed panspermia. Then you have evolution. All the rest is evolution. But at the end of this evolution chain, you have again somebody with a head, with a body, with, with arms and fingers and legs, etc. Because they are the offspring of another older society and this is exactly what all our holy books tell us including the bible and the torah what do they say in the beginning and god or the gods in plural created humans according their own image we are the offsprings of another solar system 
This does not mean that maybe outside we have beings with tentacles or beings who look like fishes or monsters, but also we have beings who are like we, because we are the offsprings of them. And all the situation is clear. Yes, it is possible to fly gigantic distances with only 2% of the speed of light. Yes, it is possible that extraterrestrials look like we, because we come from the same family. Now I'm dealing with all these uh, extraterrestrial things since more than 60 years, since I was a schoolboy. And I always ask myself, why is it so complicated to understand it? Why are so many critics and intelligent people strictly against it? And I know one of the reasons. You know, generally spoken, on this planet, we have two sorts, two groups of humans. One group is religious, it doesn't matter what religion. The other group is scientific. The religious group has been told God made everything. God made the planets, the plants, the trees, etc. But as crown of creation, God made us humans. In the scientific community, we are told it all happened by evolution, mutation, selection. But we, we are the top of evolution. Have you, ladies and gentlemen, ever remarked that in both cases, religion, the crown of creation, evolution, the top of evolution, in both cases, we are the greatest. We look at ourselves as if we are the greatest. This is terrible. We have to learn to become humble again and to understand we are simply one teeny part in this giant universe. There are thousands and thousands forms of intelligent life out there and some of them are human-like because we belong to the same family and there is no mysteries at the end. In the meantime, I have enough of indications and very strong indications which cannot be refuted again that this planet was visited some thousands of years ago in the past and before they left they promised we will return in a far future and today this is my actual knowledge we are under observation ladies and gentlemen i have given this speech at my home in switzerland i live in a city called interlachen it's in the mountain it's fantastic when i look outside at the moon it's blue sky white snow mountains lakes it's absolutely wonderful but in november this year i would travel to the united states i will come to sedona and there we have other speeches and discussions and i hope you all are there in sedona and then we meet personally i will be happy to see all of you thank you for listening